good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second in our Fossils by Firelight series uh, by the GSSA. Um, this one is specifically titled Diamonds uh, Are Forever. So hosted um, at uh, Solid Gold Podcast, which is the perfect geological setting for some wits gold, um, <laughs> as I usually say. Before um, I introduce uh, my co-host and the various legends, geological heroes um, that are joining us, um, I just thought I'd break some ice um, and ask um, the four of them, uh, including my co-host, uh, if anyone has seen the latest James Bond movie. The newest one that's come out? Yes. No, no, not no yet. Time to Die. Not yet. No, Mike no, Spag no. Ooh, Spags, I'm revealing no. your names, but that's fine. That's no, 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 I haven't seen it. And nope, no. Um, and John, no, I haven't seen that. Uh, I'll be honest as well. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, but the reason I'm bringing that up, uh, apart from the play on words with the diamonds are forever, um, it's, uh, it's a nice segue for introducing what we're trying to achieve uh, with these uh, podcasts that we are having. We are trying to inspire the next uh, generation of geological heroes, um, such as yourselves. Um, so in this instant, you would be like the Sean Connery's uh, Roger Moore's. Um, and what we're trying to also capture um, is your stories. So essentially, we're trying to capture like the movies. Um, and you guys have also yeah, won. <laughs> you guys have also <laughs> won various awards. So you're like uh, got Oscars, but in uh, the geology field. And I'll introduce each and every one of you shortly. But um, that's why it's critical. That's why we've created these podcasts so that we capture these stories, you know, from legends such as yourself. So I'm quite excited. Um, also, because uh, all the legends around me um, have worked together for so many years as well. So I'm really looking forward to it. That's why uh, I just need to check that all drinks um, uh, are topped up uh, for each and every one of you. So but the, just to remind you that that's the, the whole aim, you know, so youngsters get this view of how things were back in the days, you know, uh, when like Diamonds Are Forever and the likes of Sean Connery were, were starring in these. Um, we have a different context, at least I've gotten to watch those. But that's essentially what we're trying to do, capture these stories um, while, while, while we can. So thanks again for joining us. So I'm quite excited uh, for this one, the, the second one in our series. All right, before um, I'm, I introduce uh, the speakers are around here, um, all of them, as I've said, they've worked together uh, for, uh, in various projects over the years. Um, all of them have authored a lot of uh, papers, um, geological papers, that is. Um, all of them feature in the overview of uh, diamond resources in Africa. Um, so uh, I'm quite looking forward to this. So let, uh, the other thing as well, um, and this is a hint to all of them, um, I know I've coerced one of them already to uh, mentor some of these youngsters as well. <laughs> Mike, that's you on that side. Uh, uh, and I hope that others as well do mentor so that, you know, we keep also that knowledge. More importantly, apart from the stories, but get that knowledge and just see how things were back in the days. And it's different, you know. Um, so I guess um, heading back into why I introduced the Bond theme, I haven't watched it. Um, I was quite excited with some of the older movies and so on and the older stories. But I think probably like technology has, you know, changed how we view things um, lately. So uh, um, so that that's why I thought I'd play on the, the theme uh, and the title. So with that, <laughs> um, oh, I'll move along now and introduce the various uh, people. Um, and I'll give them an opportunity as well to just tell us a bit about the experience. Um, and then we'll delve into some of these stories and um, some never heard before. Um, typical stories you'd, you'd hear in the firelight. So I'll start with um, um, the, the, the man I refer to as young man. And uh, he knows this. Um, and it's out of no disrespect that I refer to him as a young man. Uh, it's because he still inspires us after having over 40 years of experience. Um, you know, and he's still going strong, trying to discover uh, uh, deposits and trying to find diamonds uh, all over. Uh, and I mean, I've heard, I've done my homework, he's one of the coolest um, and calmest geos, even under extreme pressure, uh, diamond pressures. Um, so, uh, Mike, uh, David, uh, please introduce yourself yeah. and just give us a bit of, of background. 
Thank you. Well, uh, Sophia, thanks very much for um, being so complimentary, calling me uh, one of the youngsters. Um, I still feel like that, actually. But <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I've, uh, I think I've, I've been in the diamond business uh, from right from the word go. I, um, I graduated actually in Dublin and Ireland, where I learned a lot about uh, how to drink a good pint of Guinness. Um, and then came to South Africa for, for quite interesting reasons, actually. Um, my father was uh, in, the, in the Dutch Navy uh, during the Second World War, and um, he was on a ship between Cape Town and uh, Sri Lanka when he was torpedoed and by a German submarine, and he had to swim ashore at, uh, and came ashore at Port Alfred. And uh, he spent six months in South Africa uh, during that time, and he always told me, man, if you want to go to a great country, you must go to South Africa. So, you know, when I finished university and, and the jobs were scarce and so on, I managed to get a, a job with the Geological Survey in Pretoria as a um, technician in the geophysical department. Now, I, have, I just finished uh, university and my first love at university was playing hockey. So uh, <laughs> my, my focus was really... To, to think what geophysics was at the time when I arrived, I hadn't I got a clue. <laughs> but I spent two years doing geophysics with the geological survey in, uh, in the field. And it was the most fantastic experience that I've ever achieved. That I, I have to admit, I never think myself as a, a specialized geophysicist, but I certainly learned what the power of geophysics was and the usefulness of geophysics. Um, but then I got married, I met somebody in, uh, in Lichtenberg and, uh, and I looked at the pay slips and I thought, well, this, this is not really going to work. So I managed to get a job with the beers and I spent the next uh, almost 30 years with, with the beers in various places, and including uh, Central Africa and, and Southern Africa. Um, and, and I had a fantastic career with, with this company. Um, so that's really when I learned all about exploration, prospecting and diamonds and so on. And, and that really is still my first love is to, uh, to you know, understand the distribution and, and discovery of, of diamond deposits. I then left the beers and, and spent um, uh, the next couple of years in the DRC with a junior company. I learned a bit about the junior business. Uh, then I joined a junior company in Botswana. Uh, and after 10 years of doing that, I decided it's time to, uh, to uh, relax a little bit uh, and uh, spend some time writing up a few things, which I'm, which I'm busy at the moment. So I guess that's, that's putting it in, in a nutshell. Thanks, uh, Mike. And just to add on that topic of writing, I mean, you've written countless um, mm -hmm. research papers. You've even won awards, uh, GSSA awards, Desperatorious, uh, Jubilee awards, and you are also a professor as well. So what I did forget to mention is all the people around me, including my co-host, are all uh, doctors. And then, yeah, you are also a professor. So so thanks again. But before I move on to the next uh, uh, guest, uh, speaking of Guinness, uh, Mike, um, I hear there's a bar named after you at the Beers Bar in Centurion. Is that correct? <laughs> well, <laughs> it certainly wasn't because of the Guinness, I think. But, uh, no, no. I, <laughs> sure, but... I, I'm, um, I'm not sure, entirely sure about that one, actually. But uh, please, Okay, so my sources... Huh? Oh, so my Kimbalitic sources are incorrect. Uh, I just told them before we move off on that one, there's actually a very prominent plaque in a running club in Pretoria with Mike's name on it. He was a founder member there, also in the pub, I might add. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So maybe that person got it wrong because, yeah, they were at the pub when they were seeing that. But okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got a few more uh, things uh, and intel that I've, I've got on all of you. So let me move on then. Thanks, Mike, uh, young man, as I refer to you. Uh, the next uh, uh, guest is uh, Dr. John Ward, uh, who's also got over 40 years experience. I'll, I'll give you a chance shortly to just tell us a bit more about that. Uh, but he's also, you know, recipient, a recipient of various awards. Um, there's the Heno Martin Medal, um, the Geological Society of Namibia, I think. Uh, you spend quite a lot of time then you've contributed uh, quite a lot to you know namibia uh, geology um and there's the oliver davis as well uh, perhaps you'll touch on a bit later um, a specialist on placid deposits 
um, worked in all sorts of places. I'm going like Guinea. I think you've been to 17 African countries from what I hear. Uh, we'll, we'll delve into some of those experiences, but yeah, please just give us a brief, uh, Dr. John Ward. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Afisa. Uh, a lot of that experience uh, I have to actually thank Mike for because he actually hauled me out in Namibia uh, back in the, in the late 80s to, uh, to join them on the, in, the, in the diamond sphere. And at that time, I, like Mike, I had a survey background and uh, had worked. You also, after a while in the survey, you also look at the paycheck to see where it's going to get you. And, uh, but, but not just that. I had fantastic experiences in Namibia. It's a great teaching country and it also has some very good economics. You know the uranium and the and the diamonds there in particular, and, and um, the I got into it because I was working on on the aeolian, and the, the windblown deposits, and uh, it was just interesting that tagging along at the feeder streams to most of the aeolian inputs out of the Atlantic Ocean were were diamonds, and Mike and I got together on the Sasqua Council, the Quaternary uh, Association, in South Africa, and and through that he, he in, introduced and brought me across to De Beers, who I had really fantastic time learning about the Kimberlite exploration, and then got moved to the west coast, down at what was CDM in those days, which is now NAMDEB, and uh, we were part of a, a very exciting time of, of working in mature environments and extending life of mines. So that was great, and then I left and went into the junior sphere for a couple of years, um, mostly in Central Africa as well, and then uh, the last, uh, last while, Quite a few years I've been out there also, still in, in Central Africa and, uh, and Lesotho actually, carrying on there, um, really enjoying the, the, the diamond time. And uh, yeah, and that's where Tanya and Spags you know, came, came onto the radar. We met up to them in, in those years and it's been really a fantastic trip through an amazing, you know, amazing learning, putting, putting scientific rigor into a lot of the exploration and into the and even into the production facilities that I've had the good fortune of working in. So it's been, it's been really absolutely great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, John. Um, speaking of which, um, Spags, uh, Renato, uh, Spag Spag <laughs> Gary, sorry. Yeah, we um, go I, again. I, I just thought I practiced this so many times, but I knew when the moment would come, I'd get it wrong. My apologies. That's why, but we, it call was, him, that's why we call him Spags. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Imagine for me in Africa. But yeah, I mean, um, you know, people I was talking to, they were saying, you know, you're the epitome of like, you know, the exploration geologists. You've got the whole gear and your whole drive. Um, and yourself, you've got over 30 years experience, you know, deposits, uh, place uh, uh, largely West, Central, Southern Africa, uh, your PhDs in uh, marine deposits, you've worked in all sorts of interesting places um, like Sierra Leone and, and the like. So please give us a, a brief on your experience, Aspects. Thank you. Well, thank you. But firstly, um, I don't blame you for getting my name wrong. I mean, um, uh, uh, every, everybody, even the poor farmers in the 80, uh, Afrikaans who can't speak English also struggled. So, I mean, it's, uh, and, and it's Spajari. And, um, oh. and the first name, it's, it's very dependent on whether you're English speaking. Then you just say Renato. And uh, if you're Afrikaans, it's uh, uh, Renato. And if you, <laughs> Uh, if Italian is, <laughs> uh, I mean, eventually, thank goodness, we were called Spags. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I started my career. <laughs> I, I started my career in the early '80s, and the funny enough thing was that I wasn't interested in geology. Um, I just wanted to get to the field. I um, tried my luck to get into nature conservation. And that was unsuccessful. And I saw this ad in the newspaper, Geological Field Assistant. And I said, great, it says field, it must be in the field. And so I just enjoyed the field life. And that's what it was all about. Until somebody entered into my <laughs> inner circle. <laughs> that, and that man is called uh, uh, David. Now, he was just as young. <laughs> <laughs> because I have known David since 1983, I think it is, and and re just with David being around, explaining the geological sort of settings, and that that drew me in to a geological 
that's yeah. on it. And so I blame Mike for uh, <laughs> uh, having been. <laughs> <laughs> both Mike and John Ward have been my managers, and I blame both of them for looking like what I am today. So, um, from my Kimberley's days, I've moved to Namibia. I follow these guys. You wouldn't believe this. I actually follow these guys around. And uh, so I've been in Namibia with John. We were working on a lot of projects. Uh, then I went to Central Africa. I was working for De Beers for roughly almost 25 years and decided to also go as what John and Mike did, the junior route. And so I spent a lot of time in, in Central Africa, West Africa, etc. But it's been an amazing ride. And today I've decided to um, um, take some time off, which I like to call it a long sabbatical to the life. <laughs> but I think she's managing actually. <laughs> And uh, so both Mike and uh, myself, um, you know, we're trying to put papers to get a little hobbies and all this. Uh, so that's about it. it. Thanks, uh, Spagiari. I've got it right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> specs. <laughs> um, I mean, before I move on, you, I mean, as, as you mentioned, the three of you worked in numerous countries together, uh, including, you know, some with um, the co-host who I'll introduce shortly, but countries such as including Israel and, you know, not, not just in Africa. So let me move on. Now that we've done the, the, the rough diamonds, um, let's uh, go to the cut diamond and um, the rose amongst the thorns. Um, Tanya gave me the idea around the whole Marilyn Monroe wild, forgotten <laughs> that uh, with the word play. Um, diamonds are a girl's best friend. So last but not least, uh, the co-host, uh, who is also a diamond specialist, um, you know, uh, uh, largely also in alluvial diamonds and has been all over um, uh, the world and Africa, over 30 years experience. Uh, I must also mention the current uh, president of the Geological Society, uh, past chair of the SSC. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. There's quite a lot um, of achievements uh, there. Um, and she's even worked on things like emeralds. But yes, uh, uh, today uh, she, she is in her own right a diamond uh, legend as well, uh, Dr. Tanya Marshall. Uh, please give us a brief on, on your experience. Thank you. Well, I came into to diamonds also the long way around. Um, I was doing my um, MAC at, at WITS at the Economic Theology Research Unit, and many of you will remember Des Pretorius, <laughs> who was my, my professor and, and mentor. And we were working on morphotectonics, relationship between structural deposits and land surfaces. And halfway through that, he suggested that, okay, now I've finished that and I'm moving on to my PhD, I should go and look at some alluvial diamonds. Well, that sounded great, but I knew nothing about alluvial diamonds. <laughs> so Des, who knew everybody and everything, said, no problem. Drive down to the, uh, the Orange River to Barclay West, and there you will meet a man named Mike DeWitt, and he will take you around the field. <laughs> <laughs> which he promptly did and engendered a, uh, an interest in, in the alluvial gravels down there. And uh, sorry, from... Tanya, can I interrupt? Do you remember we got a puncture actually during that trip? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, in we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and then from there, I sort of started wandering down the, the Orange River down towards the, the West Coast where another geologist named John Ward took me around <laughs> the Namdeb deposits. <laughs> and uh, so with an interest in, in that, I wandered up and down Africa looking at various types of alluvial deposits, gold, um, emerald, both alluvial and hard rock, and then also the, the sapphires in, in Kenya. It's great having... Um, look at precious stones. I mean, you can put a month's production in your pocket and walk out of the country. <laughs> when it goes to hell in a basket, you can't really take a month's production of copper or iron ore. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in between um, 
doing consulting, running across Spags when you were working up in um, the Cameroon. Um, mm. Information for, for various lectures and, and all of that. Um, Sorry, Tanya, to interrupt, but do you know, do you actually realize I met you in the 80s? <laughs> yes, I, I'm just trying I to remember <laughs> where it was. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I had to take you to the De Beers, then was the dairy farm. Sorry, I'm interrupting you, but anyway, I, know, I had to ahead. take you to the De Beers dairy farm conference room where we sat down and chatted and waited for Mike DeWitt. I think it was <laughs> 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 So that oh, was yes, in the 80s. Right. Yeah. yeah, going way back. <laughs> there we go, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've done a, a spot of lecturing, got involved in um, the, the SAM code standards, trying to drag alluvial diamond operators kicking and screaming into the 21st century. <laughs> um, and just keeping going on, on odds and ends. Thank you, Safiso. Thanks, uh, Tanya. I'll, I'll bring you in. I'll, I'll just um, set the scene um, with some of the, the themes we want to um, talk around. Uh, one word that resonated from John was was paycheck. So I'll start again with, with Mike. Um, just around, you know, the early diamond exploration days. Um, so we just want to get a feel around that. Some of the untold stories, you know, some maybe not so PC, politically correct. But but one thing around paycheck, Mike, I, I, I saw yours was 220 when you first started. So can you just give us some glimpses of how things were back in those days? Uh, apart from yeah, that um, uh, 220, uh, including uh, field allowance, I, I think you said. Yeah, well, um, it was quite easy because we lived in a caravan and as a single guy, that was fine. You know, you didn't have any expenses on terms of electricity or, or water. We didn't have generators, actually. We just had these <laughs> little Coleman lamps that you have to fill with paraffin, uh, which sometimes worked and sometimes didn't work. Um, but besides that, you, you didn't have really any, any expenses. Um, life was good. You could buy your meat from the local farmer. Uh, in Bakerville, there was a guy who used to r drive around in his bucky and then shoot his cattle. Uh, so you had these very high energetic um, uh, carcasses that were so tough to eat <laughs> that you could hardly you break your teeth on it. But anyway, it was, was, was quite cheap to live on. And um, I was living in, in Bakerville with uh, a guy called Edgar Stettler, who's a, a, a top geophysicist. And, um, and we used to live on 10 rand a week for three meals a day. And now uh, three meals, I have to say what these meals are. Morning <laughs> was, uh, was a bit of slop up with a bit of milk. Uh, lunch was um, a sandwich with sardines and with onions, chopped onions, and it was always sardines and onions for three years I ate that, so I can't stand the taste of sardines. And, and the evening meals was normally a very tough piece of chop with a couple of potatoes, but you could, you could live on that until you got married, and then things obviously changed. And, and in that time, I was even able to save enough to buy my first vehicle, a, a Beetle. Um, so it was tough, but it was doable, and you didn't have any worries. Um, that only started when you were expanding your family and so on. So, yeah, the, and, and the survey was, was good with that. They, uh, they provided you with an S&T, which was tax-free. Um, so, you know, you were able to put a few rands on the side and still have a few beers on Friday evening or Saturday evening or whatever. Yeah. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, we'll, I'll come back to you on that one around, you know, some of the lessons learned and, um, you know, some of the, the qualities that you, 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 you gain from those experiences. Um, I'm going to um, come across um, to, to John again. Um, John, um, I, 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 I heard um, you had a June buggy in Mauritania um, that uh, you were using um, for exploration. But yeah, it seems you we are having so much fun. But please give us shed some light on <laughs> how fun it was back in those days. <laughs> oh, well, now that was an interesting one, that because uh, it was exploration in the actual dune field to the uh, to the north, which is a, a tongue of very fine sand that comes out of the Sahara and heads towards the Atlantic in those vicious winds. So the sand is very fine, and uh, we needed to 
to follow up on. It's right on the edge of the Rekibat Kraton, so we're looking to follow up on some some targets that have been flown, some air mag targets. And we needed to do some groundwork on it on them, and the big trick was to get in there and um, do mag and gravity. So these dune fields were quite uh, were quite uh, famous for one thing, is that the Perry Dakar rally couldn't get over them. <laughs> couldn't get through this. so they so they drove around but i suppose us being, <laughs> being geos we're told you have to go there you've got to go there. i was just learning how to use a, a gps as well in those days so that was quite interesting so we went to the the uri lads in in the kus area of namibia and we said look we need we need a really short vehicle we, we need a 2.2 petrol engine we need a bit of power <laughs> and speed and uh, it's got to be as long as the two prop shafts not allowed to be any longer so I fitted in that, and the guys did. In fact, they fitted in so well that when we brought the vehicle back to Mauritania, we could never get a road with it in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good. But the best part about it is that, uh, so now I had two young lads with me, uh, Bjorn Halverman, and who's a geophysicist, and uh, he's going to do the work, and James Alexander, a year, and I said to the boys, look, you, they, they, when they saw this vehicle, because it really was, it was aluminium, and doors came off, and all sorts of things happened with it. <laughs> it was meant to get over the dunes, so. So I uh, said to him, look, I'm sorry, lads, you're not allowed to drive this thing. That's how Murphy is. You're not allowed to drive this thing until we finish the survey. I'm going to drive it, and you guys get it. can just wait until we finished. And, of course, they were duly, they just want to drive it. This thing was amazing. You could drive absolute faces with it. Eh? So that's 30, <laughs> 30 degrees, 28 degrees. We get out, and uh, so Bjorn and I go out to the first point for the, geophys ge for the uh, gravity survey. We our kit loaded, doors off, as light as we can be. I say to him, don't, I'm going to drive. Oh, you can see it over And just as Murphy would have it, the very first interdune, <laughs> the maybe the interdunes are actually very polite. They don't have, <laughs> they don't have holes and dunes and slip faces in them. The Sahara one's a little bit more tricky. It's white sand, so you don't always see the, see the color difference too well. The sun was up at about nine o'clock in the morning. By then, there were no shadows. And right in the middle of the interdune was a hole with a slip face. And I went right over it. <laughs> <laughs> it, took, it took us eight hours to get out. And I must say, I, I, had to, I had to eat humble pie with the boys. Our I was, Mike sent me especially because I was supposed to know how to drive in dunes. So that one caught me. <laughs> All right. And um, the, there was a point we were supposed to go to, to Guinea. I, I went a couple of years ago. And I mean, um, from the time you used to go, um, I'm sure there's been a lot of change, but it literally took me eight hours to get to where I was going, you know, um, just driving over two days, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm dying. Um, so I can imagine, I can only imagine how those were, but I'll, I'll come back to that. <laughs> Before I, I, I go to Spags around, you know, navigating around the Kasai, I know he's done a lot of work <laughs> in the DRC, he can tell us a bit about that, and, and then I move on to time. Before I move on from you, John, um, I heard now, before you actually uh, uh, started uh, diamond exploration, Angola, which is, I think, a country you, you, you love quite a lot because you, you've, over your, your career, you've gone there many times. It sounds like I've heard you started at a game reserve. And so please tell us a bit about that, but also um, around the time you were caught in the crossfire and the ant hills. I've done oh. my homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's two different time periods there. Oh, okay. <laughs> So one was, I, I took geology as a as a as a fill and full subject because uh, I was into, a bit like Spags and these snakes, you know, he was into snakes. So he got sort of snared along the way by rocks. You know. <laughs> so I was into sort of plants and animals and got, got snared by rocks because they didn't move quite as fast. And I guess <laughs> for Spags, well, they don't bite as much. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, we'll get to that one of our Spags as well. But uh, but no, it was I, I was very lucky. I was very fortunate. I was given an opportunity in '73 to work for the the Department of Fauna in, in Angola. And uh, I worked in, as a fact student in several of the game reserves. And during, the, during that, uh, it was now early 70s, 73, 74, and it was the base metal boom. It was a time of our first podcast talked about the, the mining houses and what was put into exploration back then. It really sort of touches on, on the changes that we've had in the last decades. And the, the only other Stonegeros in the area close to where I was working were the JCR Geos. And uh, so we had Christmas with them. Mm. And I must say, uh, you know, turkey is good if you feed the rum first. And <laughs> <laughs> but, but, How'd uh, the turkey feel about that? <laughs> uh, you know, I guess it was the best before the right. Oh, <laughs> uh, then. Oh, then, then, then later on, and in, 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 in obviously the war came in '75. We came back in periods of unrest and the RTM boys and all that. And then Mike, 
asked me to go back with them in 96, and, and uh, I then spent a few years going back from, from Namdeb. And, yeah, one of them, the guys got themselves confused with what was happening at the diggings that I was sent to. And um, <laughs> some of the, they were all the soldiers from the same side, should we say. But some were in civvies and some were not. <laughs> so there was a bit of altercation. So the best place to be in an altercation is behind the anthill. <laughs> <laughs> So that was like, it was in the late 90s. Eh? Yeah. No, no, that's interesting. Thanks, yeah. uh, uh, John. Um, okay, uh, Spags? I'm, I'm going to just ch okay. chip, chip in there, Sophie. So talking about hiding behind the uh, the anthills, I was uh, working up in the Central African Republic, and we were also out in the middle of, of nowhere doing a, a, a survey looking for, for diamonds. And suddenly the, the presidential guard that was there to protect us against the um, the rebels saw a monkey in the trees and so they wanted monkey for dinner. <laughs> so out with the AK-47 <laughs> and the safest place to be was behind the monkey actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, uh, please carry on with some of your experiences that you had that before we move on to Spags. Uh, that's, yeah, I mean, um, some of the things you encountered and especially in the early days, um, you know, uh, if you could just yeah, <laughs> share some stories there. It's also um, what John was saying in, the, in Angola. We were up in the north east, Linda North somewhere, mm -hmm. as everybody was in those days. And we were having dinner um, in our house in the, the village, and the local camp commander was, was there with us, him and his guys. And we were having our dinner, and in the background you hear some AK-47 fire. Anyway, the commander says, don't worry, it's just the guys being excited. Okay, you're not worried? I'm not worried. Have another... <laughs> For one, very bad Portuguese one. Anyway, a little bit later into the the meal, the fire started getting a little bit more and louder. And we looked at him, and he said, "It's just the boys being excited. You're not worried. I'm not worried." Another sip of bad Portuguese wine. <laughs> but later, there was heavier fire going on. Still in the distance, we looked at him. He called one of his lackeys from over there and whispered in his ear. No, don't worry, he says. It's just the guys being excited. They're, they're having a party there. You're not worried? I'm not worried. Another sip of por bad Portuguese wine. But then we started getting incoming fire into the village that we were staying Gosh. in. So mortar was coming in. <laughs> and he said... Perhaps we'd better take refuge. So we grab a couple of bottles of this very bad Portuguese wine and head off to the, the bomb shelter, which in our case was an upturned uh, bath, one of these old uh, cast iron um, <laughs> <laughs> ball and claw bathtubs. And we spent the rest of the evening under that with the very bad Portuguese wine. <laughs> um. Sorry, before I, I move on to Spags, um, it, when I was in Guinea, uh, uh, John, and you would know, I was in, I went to the Ken Ken area. So firstly, oh, yeah. um, the flights were like the milk run, so like numerous stops. It took us over seven days. We were only on site for one and a half days. So <laughs> it's the uh, the flights, which is like the milk run. And then when you get to the capital, driving all the way there, um, like you said, Tanya earlier, tire burst, we had numerous ones. And there we are sitting outside with our armed guy because you need to travel <laughs> with an armed guy, right? So, so anyway, that, that's quite a, you know, uh, it was quite an experience. But I can imagine how it was back in the days. Um, let me go over to you uh, over there, Spags. Um, the Kasai, how was it um, navigating around there? You've done quite a lot of work there, uh, DRC, uh, and you can share any other experiences similar to that. Firstly, before we head into DR Conga and talking about hiding behind termites, I remember <laughs> once with John Ward, I, you, you'll notice there's a common denominator here. It's a different <laughs> yeah. And um, I remember traveling with him uh, to Porfada. Uh, in fact, we were traveling towards Oranium and we we're going through Porfada. And John, 
and I hope he's still working on this, had this theory about polished surfaces. Ah. And um, as we were driving, he said, look, 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 stop. And we screeched to a whole polished surface there. It must be. It must be a glacial surface. And we climb over this fence and um, and he's busy looking around and I'm looking around and we hear this bucket driving past at a great pace. And then suddenly there's a screech of tires. So I went and hid in a gully because I knew that's <laughs> not good. Yeah. All of a sudden, we heard this whining of a reversing vehicle, Why reversing all the way back. And I just peeped over this gully and I saw this humongous far, uh, farmer walking towards me. And, um, and he said with him, a nine millimeter, no doubt. You know, I think I think his fists were like a nine millimeters. <laughs> and he looked at John Amir, and I thought, oh dear, there we go. And he said to John, "What are you doing on my farm?" And all John could respond was, "Oh, is it your farm?" And I thought, <laughs> I'm going to hear. I'm going to hear the sound of a very, very hard slap. And, um, and anyway, so John, you know, he's very good at sort of wriggling himself out of tight situations, and he managed this one very well. So that I just thought about hiding behind termite mounds versus hiding in a gully. The Kasai, yeah, the DRC was, was very interesting. I mean, and again, the common denominator, De Witt, is responsible for it. <laughs> when I visited it on a recce trip with John and Hilke Jelsma and everybody, and we drove into Chikapa and we camped at other, it was a Southern Eras camp then, um, I said to myself, oh my gosh, I do not ever, ever want to ever be in this place again. And of course, you can imagine where I've landed up. <laughs> I'm in truck Witt and John Ward. <clears throat> so with the beers in Chikapa, uh, we managed to find a campsite, which was not far from the airport, and was probably in the wrong position, I have to admit. Uh, it was next to the Russian pilots, uh, a, a large, we camped it off with fence. And I lived in a tent and a very, very rudimentary camp with palm fronds over a wooden structure as my office, et cetera, et cetera. And like Mike DeWitt in his early years, I lived off rice and bully beef because <laughs> uh, he couldn't get much in Chikapa. And so it was bully beef and rice in the morning and rice and bully beef in the afternoon and then pasta and bully beef. And so there was all this assortment of bully beef uh, meals. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I must admit, John, I still, uh, uh, you and Mike David, I still curse you for those days. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and obviously, man. yeah, and, also, and obviously living next door to Russians, uh, all that bully beef went down with vodkas. <laughs> and um, and, and the great. worst was, that having to know that to fly with the Russians, and that's what we did. We flew in these 1948 biplanes called AM2s, Antonovs. And, um, you know, the plane was actually made out of canvas. And um, <laughs> realizing that, hang on, my Russian pilot actually had his swigs of vodka in the morning to fly us out. It was a little bit unsettling, but he assured us that this thing, crashes at 60 kilometers per hour it's like a parachute <laughs> and that's what he called it the parachute and then, i'll never forget my flight from kananga to chikapa where we had to before we set the camp out i forget the belgian logistics guy's name he was with the beers can you remember his name the big belgian uh, guy yes eric Hall. Eric, yeah, Eric. Yeah, so I flew with Eric. Eric somehow managed to coax in a Belgian pilot who had this small little aeroplane and it was a twin prop. And off we flew. And um, 
And flying through these huge clouds with a small plane wasn't the best of flights that I've experienced. And so we landed in Chukapa and we saw, got the camp sorted out, etc. And then we went back in the plane. And all the Russian pilots, I'll never forget this, they were all standing on the edge of the, um, of the runway, uh, the apron where the plane was parked. And the Belgian guy said, all right, right propeller. And, brrr, and off it went. I said, good, left propeller, and it brrr, chuck, 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 pop, 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 and it stopped. <laughs> and now I'm looking, and the Russian pilots all got this huge smile on their face, and he said, right, left propeller, brrr, chuck, 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 poof, big black smoke. I thought, oh, goodness <laughs> me. Then the Belgian pilot climbed out, took out a spanner, and started whacking away at the end <laughs> then when you see a russian pilot putting his hands to his head saying oh my gosh then you know he's going to have us <laughs> and, and Spag, sorry <laughs> yeah no continue no go ahead sorry it was it was an uneventful flight a very frightened one uh, <laughs> but it was uneventful <laughs> No, great. And while on those flights, I just want to uh, go again to, to John. I heard you like these World War Two. Was it one of these World War Two um, planes? The same way in two. Yeah, space was on. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, he yeah. did many hours on that. Yeah, yeah. With a very Quite good the miles. Very good pilot yeah. called Vladimir Mirza. <laughs> but we might add, Spags' rudimentary camp had only one entrance to it in Chikapa. The number of Saturday nights that he couldn't find that rudimentary entrance was <laughs> actually quite, quite numerous. <laughs> But the, the, the Russian and pilots all over the place were pretty much the the, the same. Yeah. Also on one of these trips up to to Angola, we're flying up to to site in the standard Antonov with the the standard drunk Russian pilots. And in in the Antonov in the back there was this truck. Just no problem because they take trucks backwards and forwards, no problem. Anyway, as we come into into land. Just as we hit the, the runway, the back door opens and they loose the chains and they chuck the, uh, the truck out the back. <laughs> okay. Uh, why did we do that? No, the tank was full of fuel and we didn't want it to explode inside the aeroplane. <laughs> there had been a shortage of fuel out on site and so they didn't have enough fuel there. So that, that's a what kill two birds with one stone, take the truck and fill up the tanks and the f spare tanks with, with fuel and then they'll have fuel on site. Gosh. They had a way about them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had, we had some yeah. West Coast divers. Spags, if I could just remind, remember Etienne, and the boys the first time they oh, were coming gosh. into the Congo and it was wet season and, and uh, there's, we had these little strips that we landed on. There's one called Diboko, which is a bit of a downhill strip. <laughs> anyway. Well, the same Vladimir Mirza was bringing the lads out to the camp and uh, he hit a wet patch. So he, he slipped off the runway, tilted the, tilted into the grass and bent the wing. And as Pax says, you know, if, you, if the Russians were worried about that, that, that engine being hit, there's nothing for Vladimir. He just got out with a four-pound hammer and straightened the wing and all. Rest. Those poor South Africans sitting in that plane, they didn't know what was happening. They were pretty shaken lads when they got to camp. <laughs> Mike, yeah. were you on that field trip in, in Canada when the, 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 the pilot came in from uh, the, that Tobias project and we sort of landed, but during the, the flight there had been the, um, a lot of turbulence and all the luggage had moved. And as we taxied into the, the apron to stop, the whole plane sort of lifted up and <laughs> fell over backwards <laughs> and it sort of landed up on its tail. <laughs> to climb out this thing at 45 <laughs> degrees and the next morning we drove past and here's the co-pilot who was responsible for this he'd been demoted to cleaning the plane <laughs> <laughs> sounds like your um, uh, yeah. russian pilots had the spirit uh, the vodka <laughs> why yes. on that Sorry, must, John. Um, oh uh, please uh, go ahead no i was just going to say um so Although, you know, people don't get my name r right, neither did the Russians. They used to <laughs> shout over the fence. They used to shout over the fence, hey, Italiano, come and have a... <laughs> 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 um, sorry, John, uh, and you'll probably figure out who my source was. Um, apparently, you missed a plane crash by like an hour at some point. 
Yes, now yeah. you know who my source was. Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, look, some, some, sometimes things are not good yeah. and sometimes things are bad. That's sure, really sure. sad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know what? Yeah. No, I'm glad so you are here. We can, we can tell your story, we, right? No, yeah, so, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, that, sorry on that, yeah. Yeah, no, that was Angola, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. They, they, we were supposed to fly out on a Friday morning. They decided to fly a guy out on, who was sick with, with the malaria. Yeah, right, yeah. It was Thursday night, and they just didn't make it back to mm. back to Rwanda. And that, that I think, is one of the whole things about working up there. I mean, that everybody around the table will, will, will appreciate. When you get into those planes, yeah. if they're not the slow-flying AN2s, as far as I'll me with absolutely convinced, you'd never hit the ground at more than 60k an hour. And Spags will, will remember, he, he actually landed that plane going backwards in, oh. in the storm. Because wow. those storm fronts are absolutely yeah. vicious. Those tropical storms, I mean, the high felt has big storms. But my goodness, they get, they get amplified. They go on steroids up there. And we saw that, you know, in 2012 in that United Nations plane, 34, and then came in and didn't. You talk about old hands. He was a young lad. He said, no, no, he's got everything under control. And the SAA boys are waiting at the back and everybody else is waiting up, up top there for the storm to pass. And when he came in, the, that, uh, yeah. the sheer front took him out, you know. And, uh, and I think those are the things you, you, have, sure. to re you have to realise out there. And I think that's also one of the things, you know, you, you just take for granted, I'm sure Mike is very telling you, we all do. When you're out there, you just take for granted mm. you're going to come back. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You never, ever doubt that something isn't going to happen. You're going to have a couple of flat tyres. Yeah. You might have to stuff a tyre with a bit of grass. Yeah, whatever it is. Eh? But you never think that you, you never not going to come back. back. Yeah. <laughs> now, John, you mentioned malaria as well, because obviously, I mean, I, I've been to the DRC and, you know, guys are like drinking quinine. I had my <laughs> melanoma or whatever, prophylaxis and so on. I mean, that, does everyone, anyone have uh, interesting malaria stories or, or cases? Well, I'm allergic to chloroquine. Oh. So oh. I never, was never able to take um, anti-malarials. And again, up in Angola, we were staying at one of the United Nations camps. And the, the doctor, they were chatting about how they deal with their long-term people in the tropics. And he had a wonderful solution, and I have used it every day since I met him. Drink lots of tonic water during the day. Fortunately, I like tonic water. <laughs> so you drink as much as you can, and every evening you chase it down with three shots of preferably a white spirit, but whiskey will do. GNT. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and it works. Uh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't got malaria ever. All right. All right. No, no, well, thanks. Yeah, you know, I've got to tell a malaria story here because well, Spags didn't tell you that his interest in the field in early years was snakes. Eh? So, so he had buddy... He had snakes stacked in that house of his in Kimberley enough to, and every puff had liked him, but they looked at you and you could see they didn't like you. <laughs> but anyway, so, so in the days when we were still travelling well and long before this bloody COVID, but Spags was in the camp on his own, virtually, and uh, I was just about to get on the plane to Australia. And he phones me, he says, Yes, John, I've been bitten by a snake. So I'm in the queue getting on. So I had it up there. Spags, what the bloody hell are you working, paying mistakes for? He just, just. He says, no, man, I'm very sick. I got malaria. I got outside to catch it. I put my hand on the door and the snake bit me. And give Spags his due. He got on the internet and he, he was a, Spags was a bloke in America eh, that identified the snake. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it was a herpetologist here yep. in America <laughs> who identified the snake. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this I is, a... this, the, the, fun, the funny thing is, is that because in those young days I would be going catching snakes, yeah. everybody assumed you bugger you've been catching you got yeah. bitter and this is the only time where i actually wasn't uh, I was <laughs> no. no but that was a tricky one because if it had been a really poisonous snake it was actually going to be difficult getting spags out we had a remote camp in sambula yeah and we had a caravan available to us then but it was touching that afternoon they spags out yeah, where they could get in and yeah now we had a thunderstorm also coming thunderstorm. in thunderstorm uh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have been and i was about to ask i mean spags with your lack of snakes you must have designed the snake chart that we see in many exploration <laughs> camps i've been in one such in botswana where we had oh go and identify but you know in like our african culture um you know unfortunately you see a snake it's dangerous to us uh, so you see it you you know get rid of it in inverted commas 
Um, and I'm sure you've heard the story of the person who they gave um, a carton of milk because a spitting cobra spat into his eyes and mm. he actually drank it, not put it in his <laughs> eyes. <And> was, <laughs> 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 That's what happens in exploration games yeah. out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to circle back um, um, uh, to, to Mike now. Um, so I, I just want to understand some highlights in your careers. Um, Mike, I know, for example, you know, uh, Botswana, you love quite a lot. You, you still do quite a lot of work. You were there for the um, 50th anniversary of like Orapa. You were leading the field trips. And as the speakers and, and the coast has, has said here, uh, you are always the culprit for showing people around, you know. But um, I mean, wh what are some of the highlights in, in your careers and also linked to that, what, um, you know, those e experiences in the early uh, diamond exploration, what they, you know, taught you um, that you now uh, use currently? Okay, before, before I do that, actually, I just, I just wanted to um, also share you an experience that I had in 1996, because that was a time when, when Angola was just starting up and um, UNITA was still fighting in, in, uh, in the Lundas. So it was very hard to get there. You had to fly in and, and spiral down to Sarima Airport and so on. And we were just starting to take the first stream samples uh, and we were trying to identify where, area, where the landmines were lying and so on. So it was a tough time. But then we got a call uh, from Kinshasa asking if, we, if I wouldn't come to uh, see uh, Saseka Mobutu because he was, uh, uh, he had a, wow. uh, a, uh, a city that he built in northern, north uh, western part of the DRC in Gavalita, and there were diamond diggings going on around the town, and he was concerned about this. So he had contacted the De Beers people in Kinshasa, who had been there for years buying diamonds and so on, but no. But um, they then phoned me and said, look, I must come up and, uh, and meet with uh, Mobutu and, uh, and see what the problem is. So I went up to Kinshasa and we flew up to Gavalito and we were met at this airport. And this airport was built uh, with an airstrip that could take the Concorde so that he could actually fly out in and out with using the Concorde. Anyway, so we, wow. this was quite close to the border of the CAR. Um, so we had lunch with, uh, with Mobutu, and it was myself with the uh, De Beers representative, um, uh, Nick Davenport, in, in, the D in the DRC, with the Minister of Mines of the DRC and Mobutu himself. And, and we were having lunch uh, in this enormous uh, palace that he had built there with uh, waiters with white gloves and all that, and wines and what have you. And he was just sitting at, at the side of the table, and he had a television set next to him. Uh, and he was watching cartoons, and he had a whole series of channels in this television. <laughs> it was either Donald Duck or it was Goofy or whatever. So he was watching. He wasn't really interested in the conversation that we were having. But anyway, we decided that um, he said, well, what do we need to do to sort out this problem? Um, I said, well, well, we'll have to go on the ground and, and he would supply some vehicles. And then it would be nice to get a helicopter and fly over the area and, and get an idea of what it all looked like. He said, that's fine. You can use one of my 1950 Yellowettes that are standing at the airfield. <laughs> there were two Yellowettes, actually both 1950s. The one was used for spares for the other one. So anyway, there was a one that was still flyable. And, and, and he, it was cur Curtis uh, lunch. And the following day, we went to the airport and uh, got onto this um, onto this alouette and it takes six people uh, six people three in the front and three in the back the three in the front was the pilot who was uh, was fine then there was a co-pilot who was uh, quite ill from malaria and then there was a, a mechanic who had a, uh, a bag with spanners and and uh, <laughs> and so on that uh, sat in the front and there was myself and tender Rodega at the back he was a uh, Congolese geologist that worked for De Beers in, in, for many years, and he's still uh, in, where, living in Botswana, and, and, a, and an armed guard. So we took off in the helicopter, and we flew off, and they took the doors off so we could take nice photographs and what have you. And uh, we're about a half an hour down the flight, about probably 100 kilometers from uh, Gabalita. And suddenly the right led the right leds started and the alarm system started going off and everything going off and now you're flying over just carpet of forest 
So the pilot said, no, we've got to put this thing down. We're going to crash. We have to put it down. Anyway, so then there was, a, there was a little village. So we managed to get to the village and he, la he crash landed in the, in the marketplace in the village. And uh, shoot, we all got out sweating like mad and what have you. And um, the mechanic started taking out his bag and his spanners. He started hitting this thing and taking this thing apart. And I looked at this and said, there's no way that I'm getting back on that bloody thing. <laughs> anyway, so we looked for the pilot and the pilot had gone. So uh, eventually we walked the back the <laughs> And the pilot was drinking away there on his fifth beer. <laughs> by the got there. Anyway, so the... the the, um, the, um, we, we all joined in and there was the, the, uh, the head of police and the chief of the village and they all, we said we must put in some money and we can get some beers and the beers were of course warm. They were, but anyway, everybody was having a great time and then they got music and the girls came. We had a massive party, but, this, but the, the helicopter was down and out. And in the meantime, um, they, they hadn't come back to Gabalito, so um, Mobutu was kind of worried about his only helicopter, he closed down the airspace of the whole DRC because he thought that we'd taken this thing um, and um, then sent out the army. The, the, the chief of the village had managed to get hold of uh, one of the guys on a little 50cc motorbike to drive back to Gabolito to explain what had happened. By the time he got there, the army had already come in to the village. We got arrested. We were put in jail for three days. Um, because we'd, we'd uh, hijacked his helicopter, etc., etc. Anyway, eventually the whole story came out and we, we got out of jail. He then went to Morocco and, and never came back again. He actually died there. So oh. that was quite a, an interesting exercise in terms of, uh, of, uh, of experience in Central Africa. But if you ask me what, what have I learned, um, I, I'm very interested in um, what the old guys did and how the old guys thought and and, uh, and I'm talking now as a, as you call me a youngster but you look at all the main deposits in Africa the big T1 tier 1 kimberlite deposit in Africa that were found and you can start with Williamson in Tanganyika the, the Madui mine and you look at the guy who found it uh, it's um, uh, John um, John Williamson and, and you read, his, there's a very interesting book for the youngsters, and I, I would really recommend that. It's called The Diamond Seeker. And it tells you the story about he, how he persevered in a very difficult conditions, because he believed that there was something there. He had good reasons to believe that, etc. cetera. And, and he had a very tough life to, before he found uh, Madui. And it just shows you what sort of character it was. Now, if you look at, at, at Ekati that was found by Chuck Ficker, and there's a book written, it's called The Barren Lands. It really explains what he was doing. And he lived under very tough uh, conditions, had no money, uh, was scraping to bear the dollars to, to treat a couple of samples. But he perse persevered and he believed in something. And the same goes for any of the other big, big deposits. Orapa was found by Gavin Lamont, who believed in this, the, that the diamonds that were initially found by a selection <coughs> trust had, had a source across the, the watershed. And um, he had reasons to, to believe that. But he really pushed that idea. You look at the guy who found Culloden, Tom Culloden. He knew there were some diamonds that were found in, in northeast of Pretoria. And he, he persevered. He made a lot of money initially by making bricks and selling bricks and what have you. So he had the opportunity, but he, he eventually got hold of, of Cullinan by just this tenacity. I look at Alex von Sale, who found Venetia. He, he believed that there was a, a Kimball out there. They did a lot of sampling there. They found indicator minerals, and he didn't give up. And I think this is one lesson I think I'd like to, uh, to pass on to the youngsters. It's, it's this tenacity, this believing in something that you believe is there. And, and these books, they're all books written here. They're really a good read. And because of that, we, uh, myself and Eddie Kostrin and Bob Little, we put a book together on the early days of the beers prospecting. And it just gives you some idea of what people were like, what their thinking was, what, what their attitude was towards geology. And the, the uh, great um, passion of finding something and, and uh, and exploring and use and being 
and, and not using the tenacity, but being systematic. And that's something I learned at the Beers. I, I saw the Beers as a, as a university. We call it the University of the Beers. There were some fantastic people in the, in the labs and in the West Coast. Yeah. And they're, they're really top class scientists and, and uh, doing things the right way. And, and, uh, and, 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 so, and, and there are people who weren't that lucky. You look at a book called The Glamour of Prospecting by Fred Cornell. He, he, had, he was passionate. And he was nearly onto it, and he just missed the boat. But he was there, and he was all. And these are books that I think the youngsters should really mm. think about, of uh, read about. And it's great stories and and great characters. So, to me, that's that's my message. Is, you know, you need passion. Uh, if you don't have passion for the job, you should go and become a salesman for whatever. Um, you need to be innovative. <laughs> <laughs> things, things, people say you must do it this way, but they, they're all, we don't know exactly how everything works yet. And uh, so you've got to be innovative and you've got to be systematic. So one thing I learned in the beers is you can do, you find something and you run a, a quick mag, a mag line over it. A mag line tells you nothing. You have to be, you have to do a, a grid over it to get a proper idea of what, where you want to drill, etc. So you've got to be systematic. So the, those are the things I think we we got to pass on to the youngsters. They, and, and these books are really very interesting to read. They're not technical, but it tells you what what uh, what passion is about for exploration. So that's Absolutely, my message. Absolutely, Mike. Really, yeah, no, very definitely. Spakes, do you want to pick up on that, on some of the, the lessons that, that you've yes. learned over the years and that you'd like to pass well, on? First, Firstly, I'd just like to expand on that. It's, you know, we, um, as geologists in Africa, we tend to have our blinkers on, on African geology and their discoveries. And I came across a paper on the first discovery of the Russian Kimberlite, which was very intriguing. You know, the Russians only entered the diamond arena way later than Africa. It was only in the 1950s that they actually entered the diamond arena. I mean, already by then, South Africa, I mean, was producing heaps of diamonds in 1914. In the early 1900s, Namibia was producing, and even Congo was producing diamonds. But, and you'll be happy to hear this, Tanya, the very first kimberlite was actually found by two women. Mm -hmm. Larissa, Larissa and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I can never. I thought wow. I thought my surname was bad, but when I saw that, one, I thought I must be that alone. Papa and it was Matilda. <laughs> yeah, and what was so amazing for me was the environment in which it all took place. Obviously, Russia did not want to collaborate or communicate with the West, and if you're caught doing that, that was seen as being very naughty. And also, they they did not have the knowledge that the geologists in South Africa. So these two, they developed a sort of sampling program to as persevere. God, we there's are just a And then for the discovery in the early years, which someone else took that. And, um, but only in the 1970s were they ever honored for such a discovery. But there, as Mike says, which I fully agree with, there is no shortcuts. There's no quick fixes in, in exploration for diamonds. They can lead you down the wrong and the most expensive part, path. So you have to do it systematically. And it's all about boots on the ground. Obviously, today we have the technology that seems to help us to move things quicker along. But we know the old adage, you put in rubbish, you're going to get out rubbish. So you've got to make sure your data is correct. And the only way, and this is what the youngsters of today must understand, is that it's all about your data. And the way you collect good data as well is boots on the ground. I mean, you can have <clears throat> the greatest computers, the most fascinating software. You still got to go onto the ground to check things out. And, uh, and I fully agree. If exploration in the conditions that today, which are quite harsh 
in Central Africa and West Africa. If that's not your cup of tea, then you should rather spend time in a lab or do something else. And it takes a lot of dedication. And um, so, yeah, I, I fully agree. And uh, thank you very much. John. Oh, look. You know, they, you know, as I said it all there, in a way, Tanya, you know that only too well with boots on the ground. <clears throat> I think what's really important, and certainly the lesson that Spags and I got on the West Coast is we were, we were in a mature environment and uh, we were asked to see what was left at CDM Land. I mean, this is the biggest placer in the alluvial gem placer in the world for diamonds. And, you know, you look at it and fantastic work had been done before, really good work and everything, would, and you think, well, you know, what can you scratch out of the out of the patch, as it were? And one of the things that really helped us a lot was, we, you know, we, we did some, I suppose, I remember I was cutting those trenches over New Year and nobody was checking quite what we were up to and that sort of thing. But, but, but one of the things that really helped us a lot, and it really came from two gentlemen of totally different backgrounds. One was Dick Barker <coughs> from, the, from the, uh, the Kimberley area, who never finished school, but Dick had a passion mm. and he had an interest. And he had ideas and an inquiring mind. And through him, we got to see a lot. And he shared his alluvial digging data with us. And that's what Spags is right. The data count. And if you can see it and you can judge it for yourself, sure that it is correct, it's not false stuff, it makes a huge difference in, in, in interpreting what you should be doing going forward. And Dick gave us that opportunity in his UNAS project down in the, in the, in the Richtersfeld section of the Lower Orange. And the other person, who really um, helped us was Brian Black. He was a professor from Glasgow, and he came. He, he was sent out by De Beers to help on a on a on an MSc project, and he just he took an interest. He he took an interest in what we were doing, what we were trying to achieve, and he put a scientific rigor into our exploration that we didn't have. So we 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 had ideas and interests and observations, but bringing that together as the buff that he was in gravel beaches and gravel rivers. And that it was just fantastic years. And you talk about sharing, and that, that's what he did. He, he used to lecture to us every time he came out. And out of that, we, we, we got really up to date views on the geology, living in an isolated place, you know, a relatively isolated place. And I think it's that scientific rigor, that systematic approach that Mike mentions, and boots on the ground, and you're going to know that. You, that if, you, if you're into looking for things, you're gonna, not everything's going to be rosy, that's for sure, and you're going to have tough times, you're going to be sick of that. But if you have that, that, that feel for, for it, man, there's nothing, there's nothing like the, the big field that sits on our, on our island, for that matter. And, and I think that, you know, that, that, it's that type of approach, and, and I think the opportunity to share the stories that you've given us tonight, Sophisa, is great, you know. There's a, you know there's, there's a lot of good out there, and one of the things that I must say, Mike, is extremely good at, and that is publishing and getting the stuff out. I'm terrible. I can hardly bloody write a sentence. And uh, and those, and what's really important, I think, is to look as we as we get on the conferences that we had, the short courses that were run, the diamond short courses. Mike, I think the one that you and John Bristow put together that, that was excellent because it took the students that were there, and it also brought people from industry back. And I've been involved in that now with the in the Lesotho side, where where um, got some young geos giving them the opportunity to, to do those courses, but we're giving them an opportunity to study through that. And I think that's the whole thing of learning. Brian Black always said to us, if you've got that edge in you, don't get off the learning curve. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it is. Yeah. As I mentioned Sorry, earlier, John, Mike, can I? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, go Tanya. Ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Now, I was just going to say that I'd mentioned before that Des Pretorius had been one of my first mentors. And I'll never forget something that he said to me in the very beginning, that the best geologists are those that have licked the most rocks. Absolutely. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so the point being, if you wanted to, to be a geologist, you had to go out there into the field, you had to see the stuff, you had to walk on it, you had to kick it, and you had to lick, lick it, it from time to time. <laughs> it tastes <laughs> like it. <laughs> As well. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> The practicality was you had to be out in the field. You had to be doing. You couldn't learn everything from sitting in, in an office, reading a book, or modeling yeah. on a computer. Those things came later. You actually had to know what it looked like in the field. Yeah. 
before you could do anything fancy with it later. And so that's one of the things that I would recommend to any young geologist is take every single opportunity to get out into the field, whether it be in Lichtenberg or in Lukapa. Yeah, Go out there, absolutely. look and see and do. Mm -hmm. I, I'd just like to add about Brian Black because he became a mentor and um, I was very privileged. I mean, his classroom was in fact the field and he had this most incredible ability to teach. Yeah. Um, you just learned everything. But he also had another incredible ability, and that was whiskey. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> he, this, incre this incredible ability went to drinking whiskey out of every type of receptacle that I have actually witnessed. <laughs> it, um, I remember it was out of a, a glass, as what whiskey is normally drunk out of. Then it went to coffee mugs. <laughs> and then it went to enamel mugs and the last which was quite surprising he drank whiskey out of a teapot <laughs> sucking away at the spout because there was not, not enough glasses to go around <laughs> <laughs> and then and then dick barker was as john said he wasn't educated in the geological field as as what mm -hmm. we are but he kept such a meticulous records of the diamonds associated with the trap sites of where they would occur. In fact, I think he would put some geologists to shame with regards to that. It was just phenomenal. Yeah. And um, what was more intriguing about uh, Dick Barker, he had this very small dash hood that followed him everywhere <laughs> in the world. It would be in the aeroplane or it would actually be in the bucky that you were traveling. And this dashund was just like the Hindenburg, but it was filled with a more noxious gas, which this dashund would gladly, would gladly share with everybody. And I have to admit, uh, the field trips with uh, Dick Barker were rather breathtaking. <laughs> <laughs> and then also the last point that I have to make about uh, the late Dick Barker, and, and, and is such a dear man, was his writing capabilities. And um, uh, John, you must correct me, uh, please. Um, he started to write it up. I don't know if it was for a master's degree or he wanted to publish all this work. Uh, which one was it, John? Can you remember? Yeah. It was basically a combination, but we, Brian was getting him interested in the master's side. Back, so he's writing okay. up on the pad. That's right. Yeah. So when I was doing my PhD, I would write to him off and ask him for some ideas and advice and then he would get fired up and he would send me little extracts of his write-ups and I clearly remember this one where he was talking he had a photograph of a scour and a bit of a push bar and all that and he was talking in the caption about this and he wrote there this is so clear like a man walking with a lantern hanging from his appendage to light up the way. <laughs> of course, appendage was replaced with another word at that time. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear. But again, what I'm trying to get at as well is that as a youngster, and what I've been blessed and been very privileged is to have mentors, John, Mike, Dick, and Brian, and any youngster, should latch onto those mentors because they sort of short circuit things for you as well. They've learned it all. Don't go all through the hardships. They will teach you the ways. Get yourself a mentor. Well, get yourself a mentor and also be a mentor. Yeah. And, and that's one of mentor. the things Absolutely. that yes. I appreciate about everybody the around this. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> everybody around this table. They've all given of their, their time and their experience, sometimes as a formal mentor, and sometimes just to poor little students who are, are wandering around looking at stuff that they have no idea what it's all about. And so I'd like to, from my side, thank you all very much. But as Safisa says, there will be a bus <laughs> coming along fairly soon yeah. with your name on it. Yeah. We, we will get a new <laughs> batch <laughs> of mentees yeah. in, in July. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep your email addresses. <laughs> well, as, as long as the bus arrives with a whole 
a bunch of beer and wine. We we got that. It's a paddy bus. Is there any other kind of bus? <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Tony. All you right. Yeah. yeah. Look, okay. um, just just to wrap up now. Um, so just just in closing, you know, um, what what advice um would you give a a newly graduate itself. Um, let's start with John. Now, I think make sure you're on top of the new technologies. Yeah, when I didn't come quite through the computer world, so I'm fairly still pretty illiterate. I would say make sure you have that going for you, and then get you see where you, or see where your interest really lies. You know, if it's if it's more mineralogical, tag on to somebody who can help you with that. If you're more into exploration, go that route. Look for look for an area in geology in the rocks that turns you on. You will think you think you think it turns you on, and go and test it first, and then see what that leads you to. As Bag says, it leads you on, you know, and I think that's really what it does. It does. It leads you on. While I'm still on you, John, uh, and then what would you do differently if you could? Ish. After learned. all your yeah, over a forty year. <laughs> They're the two lads that'll beat me with a shamble. <laughs> Learn to write properly and quickly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let, let, let me. <laughs> That's that's a good one. Let me go over to 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 the young man, uh, Mike. Um, I mean, what would you tell a newly graduated self? And uh, if you could, what would you do differently? Yeah, I think so. John has said it all. I mean, you have to have a passion for what you want to do. If you don't like geology, don't don't do it. Go and become something else. Uh, and then, if you go that route, <laughs> yeah, these days you you have to be computer literate, and I think a lot of youngsters are actually, they're, they're very much more down the line than we were. I'm still trying to catch up with trying to learn something about uh, GIS, but I think the youngsters would have a much more easier route to go that. But it's still, as Tanya said, it's still important to go, if you, if you go that route, you've got to, try, in your early years, spend as much time as you can in the field, if that's yep. your direction. Because if you don't, you're going to lose out later on. And it's those guys who have really seen these rocks. And you don't have to understand them initially. You've seen them. And you see them again somewhere else. And then the, you know, you'll start to understand those things. So yeah, th I think those are, those are the things that, that uh, you, passion is one thing. And, yeah. um, and, and spend time, time in the field. <clears throat> I, just, I just wanted to quickly say something about da John's award. He got the Oliver Davies Award as you mentioned. Yes. I was happy to be there at his award and he got it very well, uh, I think it well deserved. It was a quite an interesting story because it happened at a dinner, at, uh, it was in PE and the mayor of PE and his wife were there. And John <laughs> was standing there and he was asked to give a thank you speech, which he did. And he knew Oliver Davies and he stood, went to the front and he stood up and I was not facing, I was facing the other way, but I saw everybody's drawers dropping because John had dropped his pants and he pulled up his <laughs> other pants right over his shirt and he said this is how Oliver Davies walked around and gave his thank you speech so I will never forget this it was a wonderful recipient of a, of a well deserved award but th that's the award he deserved because he'd spent so much time in the field he understood the field conditions and I think that's really what it's about that's what no thanks message. uh Thanks, Mike, and thanks for reminding me about the awards um, and, and bringing that back. And uh, as you emphasized, it's uh, boots on the ground um, that are yeah. quite quite important. Before I move on, on the tenacity, I mean, um, you know, in terms of diamonds, there's, there was the whole catchphrase, diamonds are forever, now real is rare, slightly modified. Uh, are diamonds forever? A uh, parting point from you, Mike? Yeah, I think, I think there is still a, a strong uh, demand for uh, natural diamonds, and I think that that uh, will continue in the future. There is also a, a room for um, lab-grown diamonds, um, but I think it, it's it's something that will balance out, and I think that the natural diamonds will still continue for a long time to come, uh, particularly now with uh, with very nice-looking diamonds, uh, type twos and and coloured diamonds and so on. Um, I think uh, people still like the natural. Uh, diamonds yeah. and of course there are a lot of people who, who would be happy to to get a, the the, um, the lab grown diamonds so i think there is a balance 
I'm just going to, to trip in here. You're all gentlemen sitting around here. Which one of you is going to be brave enough to go to your wife or girlfriend and say, darling, I love you enough to give you an imitation diamond? Well, that's a very interesting point, actually, because <laughs> there are three, a, a man in his life has got three times when he gives, uh, buys a diamond. The first diamond he buys is for his wife when they get engaged. <laughs> the second diamond, which is slightly bigger, is for his mistress. <laughs> And the third diamond is the biggest and most beautiful diamond he will ever buy, and that's for his wife when she finds out about the mistress. <laughs> <laughs> and it better not be a fake diamond. <laughs> exactly. Real is Ray and King Penta. Do -do -do -do. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, Tanya, I, I, I would just rather buy her a Land Cruiser so that I can also drive. <laughs> oh, that, that's, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's being resourceful there, Spags. <laughs> that's brilliant. Any, any further things uh, you want to add? Um, all right, just, yeah, moving forward. And um, what would you do differently, um, you know? Are you, well, are you happy as, on your side? As, as Mike and John have said it well, and... But there's one thing that I would suggest for a youngster who gets involved in exploration is to dabble in some production geology as well. Yeah. That actually makes a good mix. You know, I've always tended to run away from production geology in the fear of, oh, I'm going to be in a mine. Oh, my gosh. And when I went to NAMDEP, I got involved in it. And then you actually start understanding what are you looking for in exploration and why does the boss ask those questions which you think are really simple and and dumb in a sense so double in, pro in production geology it actually is a blends in pretty well uh with your explorer exploration experience and um and the rest yeah as mike and john say it's a passion you need a passion for it and stick to basics I mean, yeah. all the Kimberlite, most of the Kimberlite mines in the old days were done on basic exploration. Stick to basics. That's it. What would I have I done differently? I don't think I would have done anything differently. I, th I think, yeah. <laughs> I think it was you know, you know, way I went snakes. forward. Yeah, snakes, yeah, yeah. You have to run that snake yeah, try. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe become a herpetologist. <laughs> yes, and that lesser spotted um, snake that uh, John mentioned. Um, <laughs> all right, that, that. I, I, I might just add, Spags was actually born at Matui, huh? at Williamson. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So in, the, in those genes and blood of his, there was a way to haul him out out from snakes. Eh? Oh, wow. <laughs> he, he had the background <laughs> DNA, as they say. <laughs> um, Tanya, sorry, I, I'm going to um, mention this. So we discussed it a bit earlier. Uh, on the whole, real is Ray. Um, on the whole, real is it Ray, um, Tanya. Um, there was the whole diamond rush in KZN recently, late last year. <laughs> you made um some commentary and corrected some people some of them actually funny enough geologists um <laughs> and correcting them please give us shed some light on that please and then yeah give us some some of your um gems uh, to me that whole lady smith thing was just ludicrous the first thing i saw on on facebook was a beautiful geoid um you didn't need to go to site. You didn't need to be a rocket scientist. It, there was a geoid, therefore it was quartz. End, end of discussion. So uh, to, to me that was a bit, a bit silly and the, the way that it took the powers that be such a long time to get around to it and the, the number of geologists who wrote posts and said, yes, <laughs> it's interesting and you could have this theory and you could develop that. I mean, Absolute nonsense. There wasn't <laughs> ever going to be a diamond coming out of there. And if you needed any any other convincing, just bring in a diamond buyer from Joburg and ask him if he would buy it from you. Sorry, Safila, may I just add to that, actually? It was quite an interesting uh, time in the 1950s when uh, a lot of golf courses 
in South Africa, <laughs> in the town, where, uh, where Chris that uh, concentrate from Kimberley, uh, from the mines, to use for their for their fairways, uh, for for their um, areas where you uh, hit, go for the good for the for the hole, and uh, so there was quite a lot of transport of Kimberlytic. Uh, concentrate that went from Kimberley to Natal and one of the golf courses was near Lady Smith. And uh, <laughs> many years later, when the beers started doing regional exploration programs, they started picking up these anomalies around these towns. <laughs> and, and they're finding all these. And, and it was only then that they gave that we managed to get a list of golf uh, courses that had requested Kimberlite concentrate uh, in a towel that we're able to say, oh, well, that's not a, that's not a Kimberlite, that's a golf course. <laughs> and so, uh, it was quite interesting that, it's, that some people may have thought, well, this, this whole story about Natal with these quartz crystals, there may be a story that because there was, there were some interesting anomalies around that part of the world. <laughs> Talking about anomalies, Mike, please tell the story about the, um, the, the samples that you guys had taken up in Botswana that got stolen, <laughs> truck that got stolen. Oh, no, this, this, these were samples in Canada. The, oh. the Canadian, we were doing, uh, um, we were doing sampling of the Kimber lines in Canada using large diameter drilling. And you, you can imagine the cost of that in Canada was enormous because you had to do it in the winter. And then the samples would come out to concert in bags. The bags would be transported. This was the early days. The, the bags were transported by ship to South Africa. They would then be uh, trucked from Durban to Joburg and then trucked again from Joburg to Kimberley. So uh, I was in my office in Centurion on Friday afternoon and um, the truck was going to leave to take concentrate from one of the Kimberleys in Canada to Kimberley. And I got a phone call and said, well, the, I'm afraid to say that uh, the, uh, the driver has been picked up. He was bound to a tree uh, in, in the West Rand, and his truck has been hijacked. Cheaper. So you can imagine the loss of these were drill samples from Canada that have taken lots of money to, to acquire, <coughs> to, uh, to take the Kimberley. So I, I asked around and, and I phoned uh, Mr. Oppenheimer and said, could we use the chopper to fly around that western part of, of, uh, of uh, Joburg and see if we can spot the truck or whatever. We did that, nothing found. So um, police didn't find anything, da da da, et cetera, it's a long story. Eventually I decided to take a private detective. So this guy came to my office in uh, Centurion and it, was, it wasn't like, you see on the TV these private detectives, which are big <laughs> mancho mans with sun tan and whatever. This was an old guy who was quite overweight and whatever. And he said, oh, not complex. Anyway, so I, he went off, and a week later, I got a phone call. He said, No, we've located the truck. So um, it was just outside Pochestrum on a farm. And uh, so we all got the police in, and we drove out there, and there was the truck. And um, there was all the bags that the, each bag was a sample from a certain drill hole, from a certain level. They'd taken all the bags out and piled it on one heap. <laughs> and um, so then we went, confronted the farmer. I said, well, he doesn't know how this truck got into his yard. <laughs> and all, the, all the tools of the truck were in his, in his uh, warehouse. They didn't, he didn't understand how this all happened. <laughs> anyway, he, he got nailed. But we, we ended up with all this material that was completely mixed up and had to redrill that whole program it was, it was quite a setback actually yeah. is, is that what you're referring to Tanya? yes and did, didn't he then tell you that uh, don't worry we'll we'll fill the uh, the packets again from from the heat <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> sadly and it, it had a sad story actually because the guy had committed suicide in the end uh, he'd been involved in all sorts of other funny things and so on so it was, a, it was a bit of a sad story. But, and so we took all that sample and we put it through our DMSs, hoping to find nothing. So at least then all the samples were negative. But of course, we found some diamonds and you never know where they are. <laughs> we, we have to repeat the whole program. Uh, yeah. Uh, well. Guys, yes, thank, thank you all so much. It's been a lovely evening chatting with, with you all. I know there are a million other stories.
<laughs> but uh, we will get to those on a, another time with lots of red wine again. Hopefully, we'll be able to get together in person next mm -hmm. time and do this. So again, from us at the, at the GSSA, thanks to Safiso for, for hosting this and uh, John for, for being in studio and especially to Mike and Spags dialing in from Cape Town. And yourself, Tanya, as the co-host. Yeah, Thank you. Well Thanks, done. Man. That was yes. brilliant. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, yeah. guys. See you all again you. on another prospect right. somewhere. Cheers, young men. We'll meet in person. <laughs> no violence, though. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Yeah.